thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I want to just mention what wonderful hospitality I've received from Patrick and from Glenn and from Rabbit St. Judy and Rabbi Singer. Uh, this has been an, a magical visit so far, and I hope it'll, its climax will be this presentation, which is actually, it's a rather sad theme that I have. This is a theme that has reduced at least strong women, if not strong men, to tears. I have friends who tell me without much shame that every year when they read this story, this biblical story of Moses' last ditch attempt with God, that the prayer that he makes to God in Deuteronomy 3, uh, his last ditch attempt to say, Ebrana, let me cross over and let me see that good land. And God's answer. We'll look at that now in some, in some detail. I get back to my strong women, that my strong women friends tell me that year after year when we read this portion in the synagogue, uh, they have wept. Each time, for some reason, it gets to them as if, as if it's new, as if it's something so deep that it's really never staled by time. Now, this is the story I want to work on with you today. In other words, not a happy story, one might say, but it's a story about a story. That's what I want to propose to tell you today. I, well, I want to narrate a story about a story. The story I want to narrate is about a story that Moses tells the people about this most intimate moment. After all, it's a moment in which Moses, of his own accord, decides to reveal to the people what happened at one particularly frustrating and humiliating, you might say, encounter with God. And the question I'll be asking, the question that has all the energy in it um, at the beginning of our, at the outset, will be why does he choose to tell his people in the last months of his life, the last five months of his life, which is the period of time covered by the book of Deuteronomy, is dated at the very beginning, and we know that that date is five weeks before the traditional understanding for the date of Moses' death. Uh, what he chooses to put pack into his deathbed speeches, the speeches of the last months, well, there is a certain amount of history, of reworking of history, thinking back to time, to the commandments, and at the heart of it, this most personal story. It's startlingly personal story, which seems in a way off, off center. Why does Moses choose to relate this to the people? Let's have a look at the story. Um, I, I will actually tell you the story that he tells the people. I'll read it from the text in, in Deuteronomy. And then we'll see where that takes us. And it will take us far afield. You can't have such intensity without, well, palpable intensity in the words of the story, without the words, the ripples going far and wide and clearly starting from somewhere deep. And so we have then the whole biblical expanse to look to, to see where, how those ripples work. The story begins like this. Moses, out of the blue, starts telling the people, Va'etchanan el Hashem ba'etahi. At that time, that is early in the story, back in their acquaintance with each other, at that time I beseeched God. Va'etchanan is one of the most intense words for prayer in Hebrew. It has the, the root meaning somewhere, gratuitous prayer, prayer on which I have really nothing to lean on. I don't have any desserts. I come somehow faltering into the prayer, throw myself on the mercy of God. At that time I beseeched God, saying, Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. He thanks God for his miracles and for the manifestations of his power. And then he proceeds to the heart of his prayer. Please let me cross over. That is the heart of the prayer. Please let me cross over and let me see that good land. Which is on the other side of the Jordan and that good mountain and the Lebanon. Now, let me cross over. Clearly, crossing over here refers to the river, the River Jordan. You cross over a river. It means to ford the river. 
And he, f- he focuses here on the act, not so much of entry into the Holy Land or of going up to the Holy Land, which is the language that's used in the book of Numbers, for instance. Constant use of the word to go up, to go up to the Holy Land. Aliyah, la'alot. But in the book of Deuteronomy, the word becomes, let me cross over. And there's clearly the river there, whether it's stated or unstated. That's the border. That's the border that he wants to cross. He is standing here at the side of a border. And he's talking about a land which is on the other side of the Jordan. The ever Hayarden. And ever is the root of the word la'avor, to cross over. Right? So to cross over is to move from one side to another side. Right? It's a liminal move. It's a move between, between border places. And that is the focus of his request. That I want to go from here to there, and I want to see that good land. God's response is instantaneous and almost interrupting. Right? It's really a rupture because it interrupts Moses' prayer. It's clear that God is not letting Moses have his say which makes it a very harsh interruption. It's not just an answer. God doesn't just say no to the prayer, which is, of course, that is one of the answers that a prayer can get, one way or the other. But here it's not just no. It's God saying, what we read then is, I'll read a little in Hebrew. Does anyone here have Hebrew? Is there any point in reading it a little bit in Hebrew? Yes? Okay. Uh, he, God was furiously angry with me. For your sakes, le manchem, mysterious statement. He is addressing the people, and he's saying to them, you have something to do with God's anger against me. It was in some way direct, you are, he's targeting you in some way. You are involved in this story of anger. In this story of God's anger, God's hostility, that he, he blocked me. He blocked me, he interrupted me, and he wouldn't listen to me. Velo shama elai. Now this is before we hear what God has answered. We get a sense non-verbally of what Moses senses to be God's reaction. That God, he feels that God is angry. He senses the divine anger. And he senses that the divine is interrupting him. Not letting him say his say. Not listening to him. Not listening means that somehow he makes palpable, I really don't want to hear I don't want to hear what you have to say, which has to be one of the most painful experiences that a human being has to endure, whether it's with another person, if another person doesn't want to listen to you, where you start talking and you feel that the other person is emotionally withdrawing and simply doesn't want to hear what you say. There's something that it, the feeling is one then of being slighted, right? of being that I'm not important enough to hold the other person's attention. When it's God who refuses to listen, And when Moses has that feeling right away that God doesn't want to listen to me, there is something deeply humiliating about it for Moses. It's not simple at all. And then we hear what God said finally, and God answered me. He said, Ravlach, that's quite enough. Stop right there. Al Tosef Daber Eli Od Badavar Hase. Don't go on talking to me anymore about this matter. Now, that is a very harsh response. I don't want to hear you talking any more about this matter. Now, that's really... uh, He closes Moses' mouth. What happens after that is that God actually gives his answer. And God says to him, go up to the top of this mountain, the summit of this mountain here, and lift up your eyes in all directions, north, south, east, and west. And you can see with your eyes, you can see the Holy Land with your eyes. You said you wanted to see. You can see, but you will not cross over this Jordan. So you can have, formally speaking, half of what you asked for. Of course, that's what, not what Moses meant when he said, I want to cross over and see. It's if, you know, one midrash puts it like that. He got half of what he wanted, literally speaking. You won't cross over, but you can see from a distance. You can look from the top of a mountain. If that's really all you want, then look from the top of a mountain. Now, of course, when Moses said see, he didn't mean from the top of a mountain. He meant to be involved. He wanted to be there. He wanted to have a relationship with, with the land. But God says, this 
you will not do. Lo ta'avor. You will not cross over. And there again is that word. That's the use of that. Instead of saying, you will not enter the land, you will not lead the people into the land, God uses that word, you will not cross over this Jordan. This is a limit, this is a border that you will not be able to. Uh, trans, all the words that begin with trans are connected with the word lavor. You know, transgress, transition, transmission, translation, and we'll see as we go on. All efforts to move from over here to over there. And God is saying to Moses, this geographical move is closed to you. No, no exit this way. No entrance this way. You will not cross over. And then God goes on to say, but Joshua, your henchman, he will cross over. And he will lead the people into the land. Now that already sets up the future. This is the end of Moses' time of office, the time when he will be leading the people, and Joshua will take over. And we know this already from previous passages, biblical passages. But here the, the question of crossing over also is transmitted from Moses to Joshua. What is the difference now between the fate of Moses and the fate of Joshua? He will cross over and you will not cross over. And you will die here on this side of the, on this side of the river. Now, I just want to make sure that we all appreciate the radical nature of God's taboo to Moses. I don't want to hear another word from you. Al Tosif Daber Eli Od. Don't continue speaking to me any more about this matter. And we remember the history the history of Moses and language. Isn't it ironic? that Moses was the one who was sent by God, according to the biblical narrative. He was sent by God at the burning bush. He was commissioned by God to go and speak. That was his, that was his mission, to go and speak to Pharaoh in Egypt, to liberate the people, to speak to the people, to prepare them for liberation throughout his career, to speak, speak, speak. That, that is the meaning of prophecy. If he is to be a prophet, he has to be a speaker. The Hebrew words are connected. Navi has, has, has associations with the word to speak. So, you remember Moses' famous impediment. Moses responds in great distress and in great embarrassment to God. There's no point in sending me because they will not listen to me. I'm not a man of words. Lo ish manochi. I'm not a man of words, and the idea of words. What is his problem? He goes on to say also, kvad pe u kvad lashon. I have heavy tongue and heavy, I have a heavy tongue and heavy mouth. Yeah, heavy mouth and heavy tongue. Now I take that as a very intimate description, physically intimate description, of what it's like to be, for, for Moses to be, to have a mouth like that. What goes on in his mouth when he tries to speak? That suddenly everything goes heavy. Everything has to be dragged, dragged apart. He, he hasn't got the ease. He hasn't got the fluency. There's something that won't let words through. It's as if there's a kind of border right there in, the, in his body, right? His lips, one of the most grotesque image he uses uh, is later, a little later, this is all at the beginning of the book of Exodus, he uses the image, I am of uncircumcised lips. Now that is a really striking image. Aral Svatayim. As if I have a kind of foreskin closing my lips. There's some heaviness, some extra, some extraness, some surplus, which closes my excrescence, which closes my lips and it makes it impossible for me to separate my lips and let words through. I don't have that. Now, so what is this? Is it literally a speech impediment of some kind, a stammer that's always been one possibility? Is it perhaps simply that he feels he's not eloquent enough? Uh, he, you need eloquence to address kings and to be effective and somehow have yourselves heard and to address a nation, a slave nation. You need eloquence to persuade them of their capacity for freedom and that God is really coming to, to redeem them. And Moses knows better than he knows anything else that he can't do that. 
I always say that Moses never speaks so passionately as when he's describing his incapacity to speak. <laughs> That's when he gets really eloquent, when he uses these images. The, fe- the deepest feeling that he has is that this role is not for him. The role that God is commissioning him, it's a bad fit for him. And that is the poignancy of, Mo- of, of Moses' general, the, 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 the thrust of the beginning of his story. And what do we come to now? Right, what a, first of all, what has happened in the course of the story? Moses indeed discovered that it was difficult to get through to the people. At an early stage, we read, he came and he told the people the great message of redemption of God, velo shamu el Moshe. In, indeed, they didn't listen to Moses because of exasperation and harsh labor. In other words, they didn't have the patience, they didn't have the attention capacity to pay any attention to, to Moses. He, he's speaking to un, his words are falling on deaf ears. He doesn't have the capacity. That's what he means when he says, I can't speak. You know, there's nothing that makes you feel so much that you can't speak as when people don't listen to you. Yes, you walk into a class and you talk and no one's listening to you. Then you know you're a really bad speaker. Right? That, that's what convinces you, that I really can't communicate. So it's, that, it's not so much, I wouldn't pay so much attention to the stammer. To me, the stammer is a symptom of an incapacity to use language. There's something about the act of communication, of coming across to other human beings, that he finds himself really with heavy baggage. There's heavy baggage holding him down, and he can't, he can't make that fluid, that fluid movement outwards from the interior of his body to, to the world. But when it comes to talking to God, if you remember, he has on many occasions been extremely successful. When it comes to interceding with God, when the people sin after the golden calf, for instance, Moses launches into prayers that save the people's life, in a, in, in a sense. There are there's some, some sanctions, lives are lost, but what God had threatened was something much more radical than that. Really, the end of that whole, that whole attempt at creating a, a nation. And Moses, through his words, through his prayers, had apparently managed to talk very successfully to God. That is, Moses at the top of the mountain is really, I've always had the feeling that Moses is much happier at the top of the mountain than he is at the bottom of the mountain. That with God, he, can, he, can, that he has a common language. He knows how to communicate with God. Often, as I've said, quite successfully. But when it comes to the people, that's where his problems really mount up. The feeling that he doesn't really belong to them in some way, that he belongs in a different sphere and he has to continually be bringing messages to them. One can only begin to imagine the feelings he would then have about his difficult role. There is an expression that's used, uh, and it's used twice, during the Mount Sinai episode, where God twice tells Moses, Lech red. Moses is at the top of the mountain talking to God, receiving the commandments, 40 days and another 40 days and another 40 days. And God says twice to Moses, Lech red, get on down there. And he consigns him to the bottom of the mountain. Your place is down there. It's as if Moses is really lingering at the top of the mountain and God's saying, you get on down there. Your place is down there. Your greatness is Gedulatcha says the Midrash on this. Your greatness, what do I need your greatness for? I don't need it. I gave you greatness only for the sake of the people, only for their sake, that you should know how to use your greatness somewhere in an act of communication with the people, that you should know how to pass on what you have, what you have gained, what you have learned up there to the people. So your real work is down there. And again, almost a kind of dismissal of Moses at that point. You know, it's very nice talking to you up here, if we put it in colloquial terms. We really have, we're having a wonderful conversation up here, but your real job is down there. I don't really need you except for that. That's what I need you for. Now, the effort then to speak to a people who are at best, perhaps, you know, they're listening and then they're not listening and there are rebellions and there's all kinds of vicissitudes. But apparently he has spent a life talking. 
And now God says to him, God, who was always his, his conversation partner, he used to learn, as we say in Hebrew, with, with God. He used to learn as a learning couple. You know, they would sit and learn together. God would transmit the laws and Moses would go over them with God and ask questions. Interpret in the in Midrashic tradition, that's the understanding. And now God suddenly turns on Moses when he asks for something personal and says to him, stop right there. I don't, don't talk to me anymore about this thing. And again, every time one reads this, yeah, personally, I do get tears in my eyes. You know, there's something about this. It's a shock, a, some, a sense of a shock. All this time you've been persuading me to talk. You've been seducing me to talk in Midrashic language. And now you want to stop me talking. You know, how do I understand this? This whole book, of course, Deuteronomy, is called in Hebrew the Book of Words. Dvarim. Ela hadvarim asher diber Moshe al kol b'nei Yisrael. These are the words, the whole book, it's actually not quite the whole book, it's about a third of the book, is Moses' last speeches to the people. But it begins with this very gr- grandiose introduction. These are the words that Moses spoke to the whole people of Israel as if somewhere his whole speaking career, which has been so difficult in relation to the people, comes to some kind of climax. It's condensed into this last passage of these last months when there's a kind of breakthrough. And I want to suggest, in the the story I want to tell you now about Moses' story to the people, I want to suggest that the breakthrough, the key to the breakthrough, is God's apparent harsh rejection of Moses' prayer. If I listen to it carefully, in the way that the rabbis would listen always to the biblical text, I hear it like this. God says, I don't want... Al Tosef Daber Eli, don't go on talking to me anymore about this matter, with the emphasis on the word to me. You've talked to me successfully your whole life. That's been, we've had a, a beautiful relationship all this time. The time has come for you to turn elsewhere. You have to turn your energy, the fullness of your energy now, towards the people. And the time has come. And that idea of a person before he dies, right, it's like an idea that again in the Midrash it's put very beautifully, that before he dies, what tzaddikim do, what righteous people do, just as they're leaving the world, as they're departing from the world, is that they abandon. They abandon their personal interests, their interests in which they're getting personal pleasure or profit, even if they're religious interests, spiritual interests, and they occupy themselves with the interests of others, with the interests of society. Sarchei Tzibor, Sarchei Bnei Israel. That, they, that Moses now sublim- has to sublimate his energy, the energy that had gone into, at, at the heart, a relationship with God, and now to take the force of his own personal prayer and in some way transfer it, right, move it over towards a different horizon, to take a certain desire that he has and translate it, I keep on trying to use these words that begin with trans, yeah, to translate into another language, which is a difficult language for him, to move into a language that will somehow get through to the people. In fact, um, if I uh, look at this a little more broadly, um, the question that's sometimes asked is, but the main question I'm asking, I repeat, just in case I didn't make it clear enough at the beginning, my main question is, why does he tell the people this story? This becomes a key story now that introduces really the whole of the rest of the book. We're in chapter 3 at the moment. And the whole of the rest of the book is in some way affected by this story that Moses tells the people. One might think it would be a story that he would want to hide, you know, in the, in the painful shadows of his heart. It's one place where he would not talk of it to anybody how God rejected me. And instead, this story now becomes a kind of hint to Moses about the movement of desire, about the movement of his energy from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain, from an attempt to come through to the people. 
Another question, a more local question, that's sometimes asked, that Rashi, for instance, the primary commentary on the Torah asks, is why, when, when did this prayer incident happen? After all, it's not reported objectively, independently, anywhere else. The only evidence we have that there was such a prayer is from Moses himself at this moment. And so there's a kind of interest in knowing at what juncture was this prayer supposed to have happened? Where can we slot it in, into the biblical narrative? And one suggestion that's made is, at the end of the book of Numbers, if you remember, the story of the daughters of Tzlovchad, uh, the man who died leaving no sons, and he had five daughters, and the daughters come and make a legal claim that they should inherit their father's land, share in the Holy Land, uh, even though they are girls. And God agrees with the girls' intervention, with their, with their request. Now, when that triumph, in a way, of a transgressive request, a request that seems out with the borders of law, that girls should inherit, the women should inherit. When that is successful, Moses thinks to himself, that is Rashi quoting from the Medrash. So the idea would then be that Moses thinks, ah, maybe this is a time when God has his ear open to difficult prayers, to prayers. Uh, he, he's, it's a moment of compassion. And he tries his prayer at that juncture, slotted in there. If you look at that passage in chapter 27 of Numbers, what you find after that is a very, it's a, it's, a, it's a very nuanced reaction by Moses to the refusal of his prayer. What we read is simply this. At immediately after that juncture, when he's supposed to have prayed, we read, Vayidaber Moshe el Hashem. And Moses spoke to God and said to God, if so, if that's the case, if you don't, if I'm not going to cross over, then make sure you appoint a good, strong leader to, to take my place, will be effective, uh, and so on. And that is Moses, in a way, looking after the interests of the people, deciding, all right, if I have no future across the river, then I want to make sure the people are well looked after. He, he's making that gesture of moving away from his own desires to the, the public sphere. But the interesting thing about this is the word vayidaber, the simple word he spoke. Moses never speaks to God. Right, if you have the Hebrew, then you understand, you appreciate the difference. The word that's always used in Hebrew when, Moshe, when Moses addresses God is vayomer. Moses said to God. Say, the difference between saying and speaking. Saying is softer. Le daber, to speak, is somewhere assertive, even rather aggressive. It's an expression somewhere of taking hold of the reins and trying to manage things. And of course you don't talk to God like that. Mo Moses never talks to God in an assertive mode. Moses receives from God what God has to, to say. It's vayomer. But suddenly, as soon as his dearest wish has been denied, as soon as something has been cleared off the table in a way that must be heartbreaking for him, Suddenly, there's a kind of clarity and force that Mo Moses experiences that allows him to talk forcefully to God. Instead of talking in the usual dutiful way, he says very forcefully, now as carrying the fate of the future fate of the people. You know, in his last weeks, he wants to make sure that things will run well after he has. What I find interesting, again, is this sublimation of desire. This. From a point where he wanted things for himself, how often did he want things for himself after all? In the whole story of Moses, there were two such moments, right? There was this moment before the end where he asked to cross over, and earlier there was the moment on top of Mount Sinai when he had asked to see God's glory, a kind of mystical desire to see some kind of the wholeness of God's presence really to see God's face. And God had refused that one as well. He had refused it provisionally. Right? He had given it to him in a very clouded way. You will see my back and not my front. I don't know if I want to go into that right now, maybe a little later if we have time. But in any case, what, what we have at the end of the reckoning is that Moses, whenever he prays for himself, God basically says no. And Moses has to absorb that. 
He has to absorb it in some deep way. And by the end of his life, he finds a way of using the story. That's the story I want to tell. That he uses the story of his rejection by God to affect the people in such a way as to be unforgettable. The, his project now becomes a project of reaching out and getting through to the people. He's not going to reach out across the river. He's not going to cross that river. So instead of gaining a concrete desire, actually, to move into the land of Israel, he's now going to stretch out his hand and his speech abilities to tell the people this story. What for? What does he hope to gain by telling the people a story of rejected prayer? That doesn't sound like a very hopeful piece of you know, spiritual teaching. You know, I'm going to tell you about the glories of prayer, and here is Moses whose prayer is refused. What are you supposed to get from that? And, and I'm not going for the rather lugubrious answer that, uh, the, that the, what you get from it, what you learn from it, is that sometimes the answer is no. You know, that is, that, that's, that's not, a Jewish, not a Jewish way of reading. Sometimes the answer is no. He gets something from it. He is getting something from it that he's conveying to the people. The question now is what? And with this, I want to move into, well, if you have a look at the sources on your page, I'm looking at number four on your page. Let me see if it exists in English. It probably doesn't. Yes, it does. Wonderful. It's there in English. You can, you can read it for yourselves in, in English. I'll paraphrase it very briefly. <coughs> What we have here is, at the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, right at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 9, God, uh, Moses reminds the people that I said to you at that time, not, again, not clear exactly when, he refers back to a time in their past history, when he had said to them, I can't, I can no longer carry you alone. Lo ucha levadi setetchem. I can't carry you alone, so appoint infrastructures of judges, of leaders, uh, hierarchies, of people, and there are three qualifications who will assist me in leading you. You're just too much for me, you're too heavy for me, you're too much trouble for me. The image is a weight there, great weight. Yeah, I need help. And in the context, in the biblical context there, there are three qualifications for such leaders. They have to be chachamim, nevonim, v'yiduim. Wise, understanding, and distinguished, well-known, respected, respected people. That's what you would want for a judicial system, a system of, of judges who will support the, the, the chief judge. That is the usual reading, what we call the pshat reading the plain contextual reading of the biblical text. Now, I'm plunging you into deep waters, and I hope you all survive happily in the end. Um, here is a midrashic reading, and it's a midrashic reading that is now absorbed in the 19th century. That's our, the source I have here in number four. 19th century Hasidic leader, the Ishbitzer, Mea Shiloach, towards the end of the 19th century, reads it like this quite startling. He is basing himself on ancient Midrashic sources. He's not making this up, but it sounds super modern. It sounds, you know, post postmodern, if anything. I can no longer I can no longer lead you by myself. Means not <coughs> what we said it means. That, that you're too much for me. But if I'm to continue leading you I will need your prayers. I will need to be supported by your prayers. Because I know that God actually intends, he has made a decree, that I shouldn't continue leading you into, into the future. And somewhere I know this is Moses' thoughts, not what he says. His thoughts are that he knows that God is going to cut him off at this point very soon. And he wants the people to help him with their prayers. And that's why he says, I can no longer lead you alone. Meaning, implicitly, he's hinting to them. Ramazlahem. Have you ever thought to hear the word hint in such a context? He's hinting to them, 
Please pray for me. I beg you to pray for me. Perhaps it'll help. Perhaps your prayers, I'm in your hands. Now, that is an unusual position for Moses to be in. Moses was never in the people's hands. They were in his hands in some sense. He was the powerful leader. He was angry with them at certain junctures. Uh, he saved them from terrible fates. And now, the point is that he doesn't say this to them. He can't say to them explicitly, I'm in your hands and please pray for me. If you really want me to continue as leader, then... Uh, because to say that would be to undercut his leadership, if for no other reason. Mm -hmm. right. Basically, what he's saying to them is, I want you to want me. My desire is that you should really want me so much to continue as your leader that you will spontaneously get it when I say I can't lead you alone. You will somehow understand what I really mean, not just the practical meaning of I need a, a system of your judges, but that actually I'm appealing to you for your full presence on my side. I want you, never mind you know, your, your talents as, as judges, I want you to want me. Now that's a very ticklish subject. You know, if you tell your dearly beloved whom you are courting, yes, let's say, you know, I really want you to want me. Uh, that might not have the intended effect. You know, that's not probably a, not a very not a very seductive tactic. It could actually put an end to. No leader wants to come and appeal to people for their love, but every leader wants the people's love, and you can't ask for it outright. And if you're in real trouble, as Moses feels he is now that he really needs. All he can do is hint to them, hoping they'll get it. And in a, in, a, in, a, in a lovely little twist, the original Midrashic tradition says this. That's why he asks for, among the three qualifications, nevonim. Nevonim means not just clever, but understanding people, intuitive people. That's what the judges are supposed to be. But really... In terms of his private wish, his relationship with the people, the unspoken wish, right, almost the unconscious wish, I would say. You know, I don't know if he really words it to himself fully consciously, but somewhere when he speaks to them, really what's pressing upwards is a desire for their love, for their, their, in some way for their reciprocating the relationship that he feels he's always had with them. And so he needs intuitive people, people who can hear what he's really saying, even if he's not saying it. Now, that way of understanding the text means then that the Medrash comes out with a kind of sardonic flourish at the end when you find that the judges are appointed and only, they, only, they only have two of the three qualifications. If you look at it in the biblical text, it says they are wise and well-known well respected. But Nevonim, intuitive? I didn't find any intuitive people, Moses says rather bitterly. In other words, they didn't get it. Lo hevinu. That's the expression. They didn't hear the subtext. They didn't hear what he was really asking for. And this is the theme that I now want to stay with for the rest of our time together. What does it mean now in the history of a, per, of a man who's always had trouble, he feels he's always had trouble, getting across to people, coming across, speaking, when he really tries, yeah, he knows that it's important to come across to them, and to feel then in the end that it's not only that God refused his prayer, but really now the theater of his action is one in which he is wanting the people to hear the unsaid, to hear something, to be intelligent enough, emotionally intelligent, yes, emotionally intelligent, enough to hear what he really wants, and they don't get it. Lo hevinu. And that's a kind of blanket statement. Lo hevinu. <laughs> Lo hevinu means, really, it fell on deaf ears, because all they heard was the literal dimension of what he was saying. Right, they didn't hear the reverberations behind what he's saying because they hadn't have in themselves enough, what can I say, enough spiritual presence at that point to bring themselves to bear, to use their imagination somewhere to understand what he's really saying to them, to reflect deeply on the past relationship. You know. Now, these are, this is a statement that's made by this Hasidic 
commentary on the biblical text, the end of the 19th century, turns out, as I discovered to my immense satisfaction, that there is a whole <laughs> Midrashic tradition behind this. Midrash going back to, to the earliest years of the Common Era, right? the early centuries, in which the rabbis developed, and I found at least two places, I've put these two Midrashic sources next on your page, and I want to now share those with you. We find that this is an ancient way of understanding what was Moses' purpose in telling the people, not only I can't carry you alone, but later in saying to the people, for instance, over and over again in the course of the book of Deuteronomy, he is constantly referring to the fact, Atem Ovrim, you are going over, you are crossing over. Sometimes he adds, Vani Eneni Over, and I am not crossing over. So there is that, it's stated explicitly. You are crossing over, and I'm not crossing over. Sometimes, and I find this even more poignant, Moses just says to them, you are crossing over. And one wonders, why does he trouble to tell them? Of course they know they're crossing over. Why does he keep on repeating it? You are crossing over. And again, the, underst the understanding is that he is really appealing to them. He is saying to them, you are crossing over. I'm not. Now that, that's as much as I can say. I can't say it more clearly than that. And if you don't hear it, there's nothing more I can really say. I can't do anything to make you hear it, because it really all depends on your capacity for, re for a certain quality of relationship with me. And the people are amazingly obtuse. When it comes to this, 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 this relationship with, with Moses, and so, for instance, here in this first passage, uh, we'll do this fairly quickly, we read that when they came to cross over the Jordan, he reminded them of all the times when he had acted as defense counsel for them. He had intervened on their behalf when God was angry with them and made decrees against them. How effectively he had acted as a, as a, as a what's the word I want, a buffer? between the angry, the angry father and the, uh, and the, and the naughty children. Right? He, and now when it came to his needing their help, he had helped them so often, when it came to his needing their help in a similar way, they should intercede for him, use the power of their prayers for him. He expected, hayasavur, it's a wonderful word, that means he thought it was wholly plausible that they would intervene for him. He didn't feel he was asking for very much. He depended on a certain quality of relationship. I always felt, without any question, that I would intervene for them, and surely they will do the same for me. And what do you know? They didn't. Now, there's a certain grief and disappointment that now becomes part of the story every time he says to them, from the moment he tells them the story about how God refused him. Already he's saying something to them about how I wish you would hear me and what I mean by telling you the story, that maybe if you prayed, maybe you could. But clearly they don't get it. And at a certain point, he simply reminds them of what happened and somewhere keeps on putting that issue between him and them, as if to say, you don't realize how much you had in your power to help me, that I really was in your hands. It was a kind of reversal possible here. But it depended on a certain live intuition, imagination, sympathy on their part, which they just hadn't, hadn't grown into yet. The second part of the Midrash gives a, gives a parable. It's a very poignant parable. Uh, a king became angry with his wife. He wanted to divorce her, <coughs> take another wife. Uh, he calls her, he says to her, have you heard I'm taking another wife? And she says, yes, may I know the lady's name? And he gives her the name. And then what does the lady do? What does the queen do? She gathers all the many children, her many children, her husband's many children, and she says to them, have you heard that your father is taking a new wife? And they say, yes. And she says, can you put up with having a stepmother? You know what stepmothers are like, right? You know, she, she sort of indicates that stepmothers don't have a good press. Stepmothers are, have a bad name. And that's as far as she can, she can go. I think she's gone quite far, actually, in saying that. 
And they say, yes, that's fine. With magnificent obtuseness. The children just don't get it. That the mother is really asking them to intervene with the father. That really what she's, she's saying, do you understand what it will mean not to have me around? When you get into trouble with your father, for instance, by the end of the Midrash, the analogy is clear, Moses is saying to the people, I started by being worried about myself. I wanted you to intercede for me, to help me. By the end, I got a bit worried about you because what's your life going to be like with a stepfather? <laughs> I'm sorry, with a stepmother instead of a mother to help you when you get when you anger your father. You better, you better start watching out for in, in, how, in, your, in how you behave with your father. It's a new period now. The Oedipal structure is no longer there. You, are no, you no longer have the two parents, you know, one of whom can intercede as your mother and his wife, right? They have that, that complex role. That the, the obtuseness is understood here as being a very natural obtuseness. And that's, that's a, a nuance that I want to introduce. I, one shouldn't be sort of clapping one's hands to one's heart or whatever and thinking, oh, how stupid they are. How could, how could they possibly not realize what, what, what their mother is asking them? They have the eternal optimism of youth, first of all, of inexperience. Perhaps they think, well, it'd be rather nice to have a pretty new mother, you know, have a new, some, something you know, really disappointing, of course, for the old mother. And also a feeling of they simply have no life experience. They have no idea of what is really meant by this, by the father marrying a, a, another wife. Now, that kind of obtuseness has something to do with a, with a, with a generation gap, with a lack of development, a lack of maturity on the part. I remember a very, whenever I talk about this, I, I tell a story against myself, which really embarrasses me. So I, I suppose it's somehow spiritually healthy to, to embarrass, <laughs> embarrass oneself in public somehow. Um, a story of when I was, whatever, seven years old, nine years old. I'd rather be younger than older. Um, my mother was going to have an operation, and she was very worried about it. And she told me one, one afternoon, one evening, and she thought that I understood the implications similarly to the way she understood them. The fear that she had, who knows. And, and then she said, would you like to come with me? I'm going out tonight to spend the evening with friends. You want to come? She thought that I would be clinging to her. In some, and I said, no, nope. sorry. <laughs> Pretty terrible to tell the story. Uh, I thought, why would I want to spend the evening with, with, older, with older people? No, thank you. No, 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 I'll stay home. Um, and of course, she must, I can imagine now how she must have felt. You know. right. It's like a, a, have to, it's a retake you know, on what you thought were the other person's relationship with you. But it was a misjudgment in some way. Now, now I'm embarrassed to tell the story because really it is extraordinarily obtuse. And maybe if I'd been a different kind of child, I would have been more sensitive to uh, the, the, But partly it's the nature of the beast. You know, it's the nature of a different generation, a different experience. And Moses finds himself really on his own at this, at this juncture. Have a quick look at the other Midrash now, and which will help us just to, to, to move further with this idea. Number six. This one, the interesting thing about this one, is that it takes us to the very end of the book of Deuteronomy. The proof text, the, quote, the quotation at the beginning, occurs at the very end of Deuteronomy, really among the last words that Moses spoke. God didn't give you, Moses says to the people, God didn't give you a heart to know and eyes to see and ears to hear until this very day. And that sounds like quite a judgment on the people. Somehow you've been amazingly insensate. And Moses is here talking, the under, general understanding is, about the people's history with God and the, the whole history of rebellions and dissatisfactions and complaints, ingratitude. But they don't, they don't, you seem to lack your senses. You seem to lack your emotional senses. You don't feel, you don't see, you don't hear. And it's quite a, rather a harsh condemnation of the people until this very day. Ad hayom hazeh. How do you read that last phrase? 
two ways to read it. One is including today, meaning you're still like that. You've been like that all along, and you still are like that. You know, I don't see any improvement. The more optimistic reading, which is the one that is generally adopted, is until this day, but today you've begun to get it. I see signs that you are maturing, that there's a deepening in you, that you, you are capable now of certain intuitive, imaginative leaps, right? Leaps of desire, if you will, that lead you to interpret and to listen to what was not said, to listen to the complexity of the resonances of what is said. Now, that, with the optimistic reading, according to our midrash here, doesn't refer Again, the same theme. doesn't refer, as you would have thought, to the people's history with God, the people's general spiritual history, but refers personally to Moses' history with the people. I have found you amazingly unresponsive when I needed you. And here is Moses airing his most personal, right, implicitly packed into the, into the, uh, the interstices, in the text. He does not let him say it clearly, I'm talking about me and you. He just makes a general statement. But there is a personal force to this statement. This is the sublimated disappointment, grief, desire of God's refusal. And he's turning it around now to the people. And he's saying, but with you, I really can talk to you about this. I can try to get through to you by telling you a story in a way about your failure to feel, your failure to see, to hear, right, in relation to my story. What does it all come down to? Right, the rest of the Midrashic passage, uh, I'll just I'll paraphrase it. A description of how God made two harsh decrees. One was against the people and one was against Moses. The one against the people was after the golden calf, when God said he would destroy the whole people. Moses then intervened and asked God to forgive the people. And God says, said, Salachti kidvarecha. I have forgiven as you have spoken. In other words, your words have been powerful for me. Right? Have, have, have brought me to a point where you know, a certain divine energy Right, is intensified, and God says, yes, I forgive, because of your speaking. Then comes the personal decree against Moses, that he will not enter the land. And there Moses also tries to intervene for himself. Ebrana, please let me cross over. And there God answers him very interestingly, and says to him, you can't hold the rope at both ends. It's an interesting metaphor. If you want me to forgive the people and to cancel out my will in face of your will in relation to the people, you, that's one thing. But if you want me to do it for yourself, then that's another thing. You can have either of those two, but not both together. So there's something very profound about that. It's not so simple what that, what that might Why can't I have both? both my own desire and my desire for the people to survive. But God lays down the rules here. And I think the rules have something very, very, very sharp about them. It's either an altruistic moment in which all your energy has been turned towards the people, or it's for yourself. And Moses then responds without hesitation, in the way the story is told, let a hundred Moseses die rather than one fingernail on one of their hands be harmed. In other words, there's no question, no choice at all. For Moses and this Midrash, he says, oh, that's a choice between them and me, no question at all. Of course, then. And then what happens? Last lines of the Midrash, he expected somehow that the people would reciprocate, and they didn't. They didn't, not out of ill will, but out of not reading the text right, Midrashically. <laughs> In not reading the text with a certain, with a certain imagination, with a certain sense of the important things, the most important things that are not being said, what is the unconscious of the text? What is Moses personally somewhere <coughs> implying in what he says to them? Uh, the way that Moses put it, puts it rather bitterly at the end of the passage is, right, so this is a, an aphorism that one hears about parents and children sometimes, that uh, one man could save 600,000 families 
when they were in trouble, but 600,000 couldn't save one man when he was, when he was in trouble. No. That's the kind of thing parents sometimes say a little bitterly, right? Have you heard, heard this one? You know, this, this mother could bring up, you know, ten children, but ten children couldn't look after one mother when it, came, when it, when it comes to it. Uh, I don't know, maybe among Jews this is a kind of, <laughs> this is something that we... Yeah. Now, it's, it's, there's a disappointment here. There's a disillusionment. And that one understands the mother very well. And one also understands the children, I would add. One knows what it's like to be a mother, and then one knows what it's like to be the child. There, are, there, are, there's certain. It's, it's not a harmonious world. It's not a world in which everyone can agree on what. But what Moses is doing is presenting very forcefully to the people something that's almost embarrassingly personal, according to this midrashic tradition. And here I want to say it in a more generalized way. I think what's happening here is that Moses is moving from being, right, his great claim to fame up to this point, has been being the prophet, the prophet leader, bringing the word of God down to human beings. And he did that in his own experience with some difficulty. It wasn't so easy for him to talk, to, to communicate. He wasn't so sure of being heard. Now he moves to being it's a kind of familiar term that's used uh, in Jewish tradition, in Midrashic and later traditions, Moses becomes Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher. Now he's been teaching them all along. He's been teaching them Torah all along, the Torah of God, as well as being a prophet. But what I want to suggest is that in the many words of this last book, what is threaded through those words is a personal, it's a personal vein. It's a vein of passionate feeling, which has to do with his personal life. And with what you might call complaints, of the, how embarrassing, isn't that uncomfortable? That Moses, the great prophet leader, should be talking about his personal grievances with the people and telling them, you know, really, I felt very bad that you didn't reciprocate my love for you. You know, how come? You're, that, it's very embarrassing. I mean, embarrassing is the word I have to use about, about this. Why would Moses, in a way, come down off his noble, you know, lofty position and come down somewhere onto level ground with the people in order to be, and this is the traditional expression that's used, what is he really doing to them? And the expression that's used at the end of that last midrash that we just read, that what he said to them, 600,000 couldn't save one man, what he's doing is, mochichan, tochacha. This genre of address is called rebuke. When a leader rebukes his people, or when one person rebukes another person for a mis a misdeed or a misunderstanding, right? the, the understanding is that, you know, you should, rebuke is a good thing, even though it's a rather uncharming activity, you know, it's not a very, not a very beautiful activity to be, you know, to rebuke something. In English, particularly, the word rebuke is a very unglamorous word. It's not a, one doesn't feel very, yeah, uh, to, to rebuke. But in Hebrew, the word has an interesting source to it. What Moses is doing is making himself fully present to the people. The word that's at the heart of the word for rebuke is nocheach, which means presence, to be present. In order to rebuke someone, first of all, you shouldn't try it at home, um, we're, we're told. Be very careful when you rebuke. You should only give a rebuke that you're sure will be heard. In other words, the, the other person will be able to hear it right not to get over-offended by it, not to be completely deaf to it, but not to get offended, but to understand it in the spirit in which it's... If, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not sure of that, then don't do it. This is not to be tried at home. <laughs> but Moses does this in these last speeches to the people, and it emerges that really at the base of his rebukes to the people, re reminding them about the past and their past rebellions and so on, there is a personal undertow there is an undertow, a very personal description to the people of where he stands, what happened to him in relation to them, how they are involved, how he wanted to involve them in, in saving him, 
The, the, the appeal he made to them, how they didn't hear it, his grief, his disappointment, something of that gives a certain kind of energy, a kind of melancholy energy, to the way he addresses the people. What is he trying to achieve here? By telling them this embarrassingly personal story. It's a story that can really emerge quite charmless. You know, if you're telling people, no, 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 you know, you really disappointed me. It's not, not, not pleasant. He is making himself, I want to say, fully present to them, as he never had before, because that was not his role, to, to, be, to be known by them. They always talked about him as someone they didn't know. Lo yadanu mehayalo. We don't know what, what he is, where he is. There's something mysterious about Moses. When he was up and down the mountain all the time, trailing clouds of glory you know, from, from up there. But now he comes on level ground somewhere with them. That's what it means to be present, on level ground. And somewhere he implies to them by telling them the story of disappointment, of a failure of his prayer, but really what he's telling them is a failure of their prayers, that they, he didn't manage to touch them in the place from which prayer might have emerged in them. Now, when what he's really trying to achieve here I'd like to say, has something to do with the energy of eros. The eros, right, the Greek word eros, I mean the erotic, yes? I mean that energy that tries to cross over. Right? That's what eros is. Eros, the wonderful book about eros is called Eros the Bittersweet by Anne Carson, uh, the Canadian poet, Greek scholar, multiple, multiple talents and, and geniuses, Anne Carson. And the argument she makes there is bittersweet eros. The nature of eros is that you long for something that's beyond your reach. You long for something out there, across the river, somewhere else. You long for it until you've got it. Once you've crossed the river and you've got hold of it, you're, you're there, you no longer want it in the same way. And that's the bitter sweetness of Eros, that you may, on a hot day, you may long to hold a cube of ice in your hand, you know, if I could just get my hands on some ice to cool me down. But of course, as soon as you've got hold of the ice in your hot, clammy hands, um, the ice melts. And that, that somewhere as the, as the movement of Eros. Eros is always in movement, and it's a movement of going across. It's always in movement somewhere else, from the edges of myself, right, the, the one who is wooing another, she says, stands at the edges of his own value as a person, right, not plumb in the middle, I'm so sure of myself, but at the very edges of his own value as a person and reaches out towards something else. Um, Aristotle extended this erotic desire to the desire for knowledge. Uh, the desire for the erotic desire for, for the beloved is then libido sciendi, somewhere the idea where Aristotle says all human beings by their very nature reach out to know. Reach out to know means I'm not happy with what I know. <laughs> what I know doesn't excite me anymore, in a sense. I always need to go towards something else, to add to it, to deepen it. In other words, that's that restless imagination that I, I was talking about before. It has something to do with the Hebrew word Havana. Havana is not being satisfied with the surface of things, that you want to go deeper, let's say. Now, um, the prob one of the problems of this is that if you're always in motion, you're always moving on, that you want to get from here to there, in a way, you are losing here in order to get there. To get there, you are, you are removing yourself from here. That's what it means to cross over or to pass. To pass means that you are there for a moment. Remember Song of Songs? Dodi chamak avar. My beloved, bikashtiv v'lo I I sought him, but I didn't find him. Now that is of the nature, that's eros in in its dynamism. I sought him, but I did not find him. As part of seeking as you don't find. I sought him, but I did not find him. My beloved slipped past me. 
happened. Hamak avar, avar, there's that word. He slipped past me. In the Song of Songs, the lover is always just slipping past her, or she is slipping past him. Uh, remember, till she gets to the door, to open the door, she has all kinds of excuses. She, she holds back and then she's lost him. He gets to the door, he's gone. Now, that sense of the elusive nature of things that pass, the elusive nature of desire, that somewhere, there is a moment of presence and then it's gone. That's what God does at the top of the mountain to Moses. The word avar is used time and time again then in answer to Moses' prayer to see God's face. God says, no, I'll put you instead into this cave in the mountain, Nikrat Atzur, in a crevice in the rock, and I will cover your face with my hand. Very anthropomorphic. Vesakoti kapi alecha. I'll put the palm of my hand to protect you so that you won't see me as I'm passing by the crevice rock. But you'll only see me after I've passed. You'll see my back and not my face. Now that means, and the word lavor is used over and over again. God passes. That he's passing. Passing means he's there for a split second and then he's gone. It's the past. That's the meaning of the word, the past, in time. The past is that which was here at one moment and is now gone. Feeling of, there's, there's a loss there. It's, it's involved in this kind of fluidity of movement. What Moses experiences at the top of the mountain is not the presence of God, the full presence. That's not for a living human being. Right? In the Jewish tradition, that's very deep. Um, what there is is the sense that God was here. Right? It's a feeling of, right? You can, comes out and finds the trace of God's having been here. And the trace may be a memory of God's words. It may be, yeah, words have a lot to do with traces. In other words, not the thing itself, but something that has to do with my interpretation of what happened. I experience something, and it's a human something. It's not the fullness of God's light. Now, that, um, for Moses, then, means that the two things he wanted, he never actually grasps. And that's something about the very nature of desire itself. That's, that's how it is. Perhaps it's in the nature of hu human life in general. Kafka certainly thought so. That human life offers us incompleteness, nothing. What, 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 whatever it is that in fact that we, we are on the track of all our lives, what we get is a kind of incompleteness. I'll read the, the sentence, a couple of sentences from Kaf one of Kafka's letters, I think, in which he makes this point, and that's where the title of my talk came from. Uh, Moses fails to enter Canaan, he says, not because his life is too short, but because it is a human life. He has been on, tr on the track of Canaan all his life, and it only comes to teach you that he, he sees only on the verge of death how incomplete a moment is human life. It could last forever and still be nothing but a moment. There is a moment of a kind of revelation, which could be only a kind of trace of a revelation, and there will not be the total achievement of desire. Now Moses turns out to be, his life turns out to be a fully human life. Right? He's not, and that's the story that he tells the people. He said, by the nature of things in some way, he comes to understand that. What is most important now is not the achievement of my concrete desire, but my relationship with you. Right? Here is now a different reaching out. I'm reaching out now, not to cross the river, but to cross to you. And when he says to them over and over again, you are crossing over, but I'm not crossing over, what is he really telling them? You have the future. You, I will be a memory in your past. That's all. I'll be someone who once crossed your path. You know? I want you to take me with you. In some sense, I want you to regard me as your teacher into the future, into all your future. You won't carry me so much as the prophet because you will have gone on thinking about the text and elaborating on the text and deepening the t your understanding of the text throughout the generations. But I do want you to remember me in some unforgettable way as one remembers a teacher. And in the last part of what I would like to present, I think, want to think a bit about how one remembers a teacher.
So what does it mean to have, a, have had an unforgettable teacher? What is the place in one's mind then that the teacher, that the teacher occupies? Uh, before I get there, I wanted to read you a short passage from a book called Mr. Palomar by Italo Calvino, a great European writer, novelist, essayist, philosopher. Uh, this is the passage. It comes from the end of the book. Mr. Palomar is just about to die. The end of his life. Palomar does not underestimate the advantages that the condition of being alive can have over that of being dead. Not as regards the future, where risks are always very great and benefits can be of short duration, but in the sense of the possibility of improving the form of one's own past. Good reason to stay alive longer is not for future joys, because who knows, it's for the sake of changing one's past. If you're alive a little longer, you may have some passing experience. You may encounter something that changes your understanding of your whole life. Your whole life could shift under this current of desire. That Suddenly there is a moment in which everything, everything shifts. There's a movement. He talk, he, he, a person's life, he says, consists of a collection of events, the last of which could also change the meaning of the whole not because it counts more than the previous ones, but because once they are included in a life, events are arranged in an order that is not chronological, but rather corresponds to an inner architecture. That's very abstract. Here, for example, a person reads in adulthood a book that is important for him. Right? It's like having had a teacher who's important for you. After he has read that book, his life becomes the life of a person who has read that book. And it is of little importance whether he read it, whether he read it early or late, because now his life before that reading also assumes a form shaped by that reading. Now, this is not common sense. Common sense would suggest that if you've read a book recently, uh, well into your life, that really affects you, you might well think, I wish I'd read it when I was, long, when I was younger. It would have changed my life. Right? That would be the common sense way of thinking. Yes? And he's here presenting, it's a postmodern twist, and he's saying, the fact that I read it, it doesn't matter when I read it, because whenever I read it, it becomes part of the inner architecture of my life, and, and time has nothing to do with it. My whole life, as I imagine it now, as I have come to understand my whole life now, it has changed because of reading this book. It doesn't matter what happened in the past when I was actually living it. No, what matters is, at this moment, what have I arrived at? What is the space in which I move? And the space here is a space that includes that book. I might have had a teacher, well in the past, who I didn't understand. He simply, he was beyond me in some way, he was too, whatever, yes? He was just, there was too much there. I didn't, I didn't get it. Lohivanti. I didn't, I, I didn't have the, the intuition, I didn't have the, the, the experience, I, there was something, I just didn't get it. What happens sometimes is that many years later, in fact the sages say in the Talmud, uh, sometimes it takes 40 years for a person to understand what his teacher said. You can find that in the next passage in, uh, uh, in your, on your page in number 7. It takes 40 years. Now, that's a long time to have to wait for a teacher, um, alive or dead, <laughs> to have to wait to be understood by a student. You know, sometimes I walk out of a class, you know, on bad days, you know, and, and I think, oh, that was a waste of time. I really didn't do that well. Um, no connection. No, no communication. And then, of course, I have to keep reminding myself um, of my own experience the way in which teachers came to life for me, sometimes many years after the time. What was it that kept them somewhere niggling me? You know, somewhere they were in my mind, even if I didn't. I knew they were just a bit far from me. There was a kind of implicit desire. I wanted to understand them, but I, I really didn't. What made it possible somewhere finally to make the connection? Suddenly, partly experience, let's say, life experience, growing up, 
and so on. But what else are we talking about here? What has Moses to gain? To come back now, by way of finishing, to come back to our question. What has he to gain by telling them a story of disappointment, not only with God's response, but the real subtext is disappointment, grief, disillusionment, reproach in relation to his people. These are not encouraging words to use. And this is the suggestion that I'd like to make. And I'm going to use a model, um, right, ch challenging idea that's proposed by the French essayist uh, Roland Barthes about teachers and students. He suggests that a teacher teaching a class is like a patient in psychoanalysis. Now, a, you got that? <laughs> not, the, not the analyst, the patient. In psychoanalysis, what's the a teacher is in the vulnerable n position of talking away, you know, talking about something that he thinks he knows. Right? The teacher is is, de is delivering his or her expertise on something, and the class is sitting and listening silently, like the analyst, right? quietly listening, and learning from the teacher's unknown knowledge. That's, that's the point I'd like to make here. What the teacher most valuably is communicating is not the text itself. The text is written down. The text is written, the, 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 the class can go away with the texts afterwards. What the teacher is communicating is the things about his own relation, how he learns the text, how he brings himself to the text. And that he does largely unconsciously. He doesn't set himself. Here Moses is communicating to the people, not just the laws and how do you read them and so forth. He's communicating a story of failure to understand, of resistance to understanding, of disappointment and, and, and perhaps even aggressiveness on his own part as he feels his disappointment. In other words, he's someone who has to learn himself to grow in relation to the, the facts of the situation. That he is here faced with a really uncomfortable and embarrassing uh, relationship now with the people. And he's reproaching them partly, but partly he's demonstrating, he's staging, almost unconsciously. He's staging a life in the process of learning Pro with much resistance. That the resistance for Freud, of course, was the key to growth. You couldn't have a psychoanalysis that didn't have a good, healthy resistance. It's through the resistance to learning. And of course, everyone resists learning. True learning, that is, learning that implicates you, that makes you feel that you, you're not good enough in a way, that you have, to, you have to become larger, you have to cross over places. That kind of learning, we resist with all our strength. Right? We really don't want to expose ourselves to, to that kind of learning. How do I think Freud called teaching the impossible profession, right, among a couple of other professions that are impossible. It is impossible. Right? There's no great pedagogue who is not actually an anti-pedagogue. You know? People who are great teachers always have very strong views against formal teaching. That somewhere there is understanding that you're, never, you're not going to achieve very much by haranguing a class. What is the class really getting from it? They are sitting there and silently registering the mannerisms, <laughs> the, the, the gestures, the expressions, the things that the teacher is not aware of, that gives you a sense of the presence of the teacher, his full presence as a human being, and how it's possible to move from over here to over there, from not knowing to knowing. The teacher is presenting a way of studying. Now, in terms of Moses, our teacher, do the people get it, first thing? And secondly, what is it that the people really understand then from Moses, ultimately? Does he succeed in getting across to them? Does he touch them? How does he touch them? And I'd like to suggest that if, as we saw before, if he said, you have been very ungrateful, insensate, no heart, no eyes, no ears, in relation to me, right? somewhere under the between the words he really means in relation to me, not just in general. They are registering this in some way 
They are registering. They are registering this. as a reproach, but then he adds the words, ad hayom hazeh, until this very day. When he says until this very day, it's as if he is partly registering and partly suggesting to the people, today you are beginning to get it. Right? It's a kind of suggestion to them, and one of the comments in, uh, in, in Rashi on this is, Today, Moses says, I understand, hevanti, the same word to understand, I get it, that you really are people who do desire and seek for God. Finally, you seem to have developed amazingly. He's paying them a certain compliment. He's saying to them, I think you really have changed. And in relation to me, you seem to be more open to me. You seem to be more open to me. Something has happened as a result of... Of, of this long speech, of this very confrontational speech. It has got to you in some ways. But beyond that, I think, if I comment on Rashi here, when if Moses says, I have understood, it's as if he too is acknowledging that maybe it's taken him 40 years to get the people. That he has had this very choppy history with the people and feeling that they're ungrateful and so on. And at the same moment, he comes to realize that they're actually capable of much more than he had thought. And that realization on his part is his growth. It's his movement to a deeper intuitive kind of knowledge that he had been taking them in a way too plainly up to now, reacting too much to the, the surface of, of, of events. And now he too feels that a moment of breakthrough has happened. Now, if there has been a moment of breakthrough here in which Moses feels that the people feel more implicated now in the story, in the whole story and in their relationship with him, and at the same moment feels that his implication with them is much more personal and now includes the, the, the depths and the, and the heights of his experience, the different levels of, of his experience then one might say that the story has a kind of hopeful ending. The story, the ending now is that he can become Moses, our teacher, in a very real way. That now they can turn somewhere, not just to the text, but to what Moses was really, what did he really want of us? That niggling question, always. What is it my mother really wanted of me when she said that day, would you like to come with me to, uh, to, to, to socialize? Yeah. Now, that question didn't occur to me at the time. The question, what do they really want? What does God really want? What does the other person really want? Now, that is a very simple key to the whole history of Jewish interpretation of texts. The Jewish interpretations of texts have always asked about texts, what does it really mean? Which makes it very clear that what it seems to mean is just the first step. You know, That's a starting point what it seems to me. And then you start all the, the multiple possibilities you know, of an active in, interpretive ability, an active imagination, sympathy, intuition. All these things can come into play in the interpretation of texts. The important moment then is when Moses breaks through on that level, on a different level, an unconscious level to his people, and they begin to realize the limitations of of the of the crust of things, of the thing of the appear, appearances of things. The very last moment of my story is it's a, again apparently a very harsh moment. Uh, I really blinked when I reread it in context of what we've just said. Moses at the last moment goes up the mountain. God tells him to look sort now north, south, east, and west to view the whole the whole of the land of Israel. And then God says to him, after he's done that, I've shown it to you with your eyes, v'shama lo ta'avor, but there you shall not cross over. Why does God, these are the last words of God, why does God rub it in, as it were? After all, it's clear by now. It's absolutely clear, and God has just said it to me. What, what is this summary Suddenly, it's as if this is the summary of his life. Shama lota avor. You shall not cross over there. And I can't help hearing this 
as, again, emphasizing the Shama. There, you shall not cross over. What is the subtext? There are other transitions, there are other transmissions, there are other underground links that you have made. You have moved across towards your people. And that was the important movement of desire. That was the ultimate movement of desire, which is much more important than, you know, your personal, your personal wish. And in that, you have succeeded. Now, that's a very large final moment then for, for, for Moses. He, if God says it to him, then he believes it. Uh, incidentally, there is, you may find this too embarrassing to bear, but sometimes word plays work. Uh, the word shama, there, you shall not cross over, is, of course, an acronym, is that the word? For Moshe. Mem shin he, shin, shin mem he, same letters. In other words, your Moses-ness, you have crossed over with your full Moses-ness where it mattered. You have, you, have, you have transmitted, you have transmitted your Moses essence to the people. Now, um, as I say, I think that's a key, not only to, to the way in which we continue to talk about Moses as our teacher, with a mixture of, of respect and affection. I'd say that. Affection might not have been possible before this intimate understanding of that people have an unconscious, put it like that. Right? People have an unconscious and need to love each other, need to find a way across to each other with that rather embarrassing appendage that we call the unconscious, you know, the unconscious that is so different from our conscious intent. Uh, and I see that not only as a an achievement for Moses, but as an achievement for the intellectual and spiritual future of the Jewish people, who's regarded from then on, regarded as their whole task to forget and reconstitute, to forget the past, to remember forget. That is, not to hold on tight to the, to the, to the blocks of memory, but to allow themselves the freedom to interpret, right? constantly to try to make life out of text. Move, to move with the text, with that desire to cross, to go across from what the text seems to be saying into the unknown world that may be discovered if one moves, if one makes that, has the energy to make those, those transitions. Thank you very much. <laughs>